Hallo zusammen und herzlich willkommen zu einer weiteren Folge von Swisspreneur. Heute sind wir in San Francisco und treffen das unternehmerisches Vorbild von mir, der Tony Schneider. Der Tony ist in der Schweiz aufgewachsen, ist dann aber auf Amerika studieren. Dort hat er nachher auch die Firma Adpost gegründet, die er später erfolgreich an Yahoo hat verkaufen konnte. Er ist weitergezogen und ist der CEO von Automatic geworden, die Firma hinter WordPress. Ganz besonders spannend finde ich, dass er schon seit Jahren aktiv ist als Investor im Silicon Valley. Ich werde mit ihm heute vor allem über die Silicon Valley reden, über die Vor- und Nachteile und was wir als Schweizer vom Silicon Valley lernen können. Ja, ciao, Toni. Hallo. Schön bist du da und gibst uns die Möglichkeit, oder schön dürfen wir hier sein. Wir sind ja bei dir zu Gast heute. Wir sind hier in den Räumen von WordPress. Kannst du vielleicht ganz kurz etwas zu WordPress sagen und, und warum dass wir da sind und was die Räumlichkeit hier bedeutet? Was das Zimmer da hier ist, der grosse Raum, wo wir sind? Ja, hoi, freut mich. Äh, wir sind im, äh, im Büro von Aramaric. Aramaric ist, das ist die Firma, die hinter WordPress steht. Also, und, äh, wir haben die Firma vor zehn Jahren angefangen und das, das Office da haben wir seit, seit etwa vier Jahren. Also, das ist unser Headquarters hier ja. in San Francisco. Mhm. Und wir sind in einem Gebiet von San Francisco, das heißt South of Market. Und da sind eigentlich viele Start-ups und ja, rund, rund um uns herum hat es da die Firmen. Das ist Salesforce und LinkedIn und Twitter und die sind alle rund herum. Also, wir sind jetzt mit dem Kuchen rein. Und du kommst dann jeden Tag hier arbeiten? <lacht> Nein, wir sind als Firma wir sind ganz verteilt auf der ganzen Welt. Wir arbeiten eigentlich alle von den Heils. Das heisst, das Büro brauchen wir nur, wenn, einfach, wenn du ein Meeting hast oder wenn, wenn jemand will zusammenarbeiten will. Aber die meisten arbeiten von daheim aus. Also wir, haben, wir haben 500 Leute im Moment und nur 20 von uns sind überhaupt in San Francisco. Das heisst, wenn wir alle ins Büro kommen, dann sind wir nur 20 da, aber die meisten arbeiten von daheim aus oder von irgendwo. Super. Ähm, vielleicht äh, bevor wir starten, du hast gesagt, dass wir das Interview würden in Englisch machen würden. Vielleicht kannst du uns ganz kurz sagen, warum Englisch für dich so eine wichtige Sprache, so einen hohen Stellenwert hat bekommen. Für mich ist das absolut in Ordnung. Ich finde es toll, dass wir das in Englisch machen. Das ist für mich auch ein neues Erlebnis, das zu machen. <lacht> Aber vielleicht ganz kurz sagen uns, warum, warum auf Englisch? Weil du bist ja ursprünglich Schweizer und redest ja auch Schweizerdeutsch. Warum ja. machen wir das heute Englisch? Ja, ich bin schon seit 25 Jahren jetzt hier in Kalifornien. Und meistens natürlich, wenn ich geschäftlich rede, ich immer praktisch nur Englisch. Also hin und wieder mal Schweizerdeutsch. Und ich dachte, das könnte verstehen, mehr, mehr Leute Englisch wie Schweizerdeutsch. Also, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, switch to English. Okay. Um, I would like to start talking about, like, right from your beginning, little Tony growing up in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can fill us in the first years of your life <laughs> in Switzerland. Where, where, where did you grow up? Sure. <laughs> um, so I grew up on Lake Zurich um, in a town called Mailand um, and then moved when I, after kindergarten moved to Stefa, which is nearby. So I spent the first 19 years growing up um, on Lake Zurich and then in Zurich going to high school. Um, so pretty standard Swiss upbringing. Um, and I would say the idea of maybe coming to the US someday was planted relatively early on. Um, I had, I was lucky when I was about 10 or 11, uh, my parents took, took me, we went on a trip around California. Okay. Um, so I was actually, I have pictures of myself in San Francisco as a little kid and mm -hmm. I loved it. I was just, so I always had it in my head that it's a great place. And then also uh, my parents were quite encouraging and thought it'd be, it'd be interesting to go. So I, I grew up in Zurich, mm -hmm. um, went to high school there and then moved here for college. And at first I thought I'd come here for a year or two, learn English, yeah. and then I really liked it. And then when you thought about doing college, um, was it clear that you go to the US? Or was it like, did you maybe check several options? Yeah, I think for me the options were either Eteha in Zurich or try something here. I didn't consider anything else. And uh, I, I, my decision, I think, It's a long time ago, but <laughs> it was more based around what might happen after college. Mm -hmm. I felt like all of the products and companies I was interested in mm -hmm. were, were here. Yeah. And 
the kind of, at the time, the kind of computer science that was done in Switzerland was, was more very large enterprise banks, insurance companies, kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I just, at that age, couldn't relate to that. I didn't right. even really yeah. understand what that was. Yeah. Um, so, I, so I was just drawn here for that reason. And so college was just a good excuse to, to come here. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how, like, maybe you can explain a little bit, like, how did you get in touch with the university you went to, and how did you pick it? Was it like by coincidence, or was <laughs> it, was it like planned? It was pretty random. I mean, <laughs> and this is obviously completely different today, but I didn't know anything about the U.S. education system. <laughs> um, I was a little bit lucky. I had one connection that uh, there was a software company, uh, and my dad knew the founder, and they had. They were, had offices in Stefa mm -hmm. and in Santa Barbara. And they were making um, these really cool, it was a very small company, but they were making these fault tolerant computers for the space shuttle. Uh, where basically, wow. you know, you could, like a whole motherboard could break and the thing would keep going. Um, and I remember visiting them and they had a couple of Americans working for them and that happened to be in Switzerland at the time. And I just asked them, this guy, this random guy I liked. I'm like, so. Yeah, where are you from? Where, yeah, where should I go? And he basically said, stop looking, go to Santa Barbara City College. It's a great place. You'll love it. Because he was from there. <laughs> he went there. And, and he went it. to that school. Okay. And, uh, and, you know, this is pre internet, so I just wrote okay. a letter and applied. And um, That was at what time? Uh, 1988, 89. Okay. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, 88, I guess I, I applied. And, uh, and then once I got there, I learned about the school system and um, city colleges here are two-year schools, and then you transfer to the next level of college. So I went there for two years mm -hmm. and then transferred to Stanford, and I went there for two years and then started working. Ah, okay. So you just went to college for four years? Okay. Yeah, a little uh, less. And how, how come did you transfer to Stanford? Mm -hmm. what, what, was, what was Stanford offering that Santa Barbara didn't? Yeah, so once I got here and figured out the school system, mm -hmm. um, and, and there was a goal to get to Silicon Valley eventually, and uh, Stanford's a great school and has great, great computer science programs, so um, I applied to a few schools, but that was the one I picked. And, uh, and then that really launched my career. I got my first job because I met somebody at Stanford and got internships, and so it was, it's, I would say one, and still probably one of the top three, four, five schools for computer science in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was very focused and driven. I just just I did everything. Pretty much focused on that, and um, I, I don't remember it being... I, I think part of it was that I didn't know that it was supposed to be hard. So I just said, oh, <laughs> Sometimes that one looks good. good. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> Let's go. Um, Let's do it. And... Uh, yeah, it's a, it was a little bit um, well, ignorance is bliss. Um, mm -hmm. Like you know, no, another thing was this concept of internships, which mm -hmm. I didn't really know what that was coming from Switzerland. And here it was like, oh no, that's how you end up, you know, getting experience at work and then eventually getting a job. So, so I learned about that. And for my eventual job, the internships were probably more important than. Like, nobody ever asked me what classes I took. Or, okay. Um, so the recommendation would be do a lot of internships and try yeah, to get... and just knowing what you want. So in my case, um, my first job was in, in a virtual reality startup. Okay. Which, uh, At for that many, time? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so that was, like, the first phase of virtual reality when it, yeah. um, in the early 90s. And I... And it was, I really wanted to be in that field. I've just found it so exciting. And I remember back in Switzerland reading an article about virtual reality in Dokusatzeit, <laughs> Magazine. Yeah. Um, and I was just completely fascinated by it. And, uh, and I remember the article was about this guy, Scott Fisher, mm -hmm. who was at NASA and was building a, the first sort of some semi-commercial virtual reality setup, and uh, he there were several startups working with him to build build it for NASA. And um, I just remember I kept that article for a long time, thinking, God, it's not just that's what I want to do. And then mm -hmm. I ended up um, getting an internship at one of those startups from nice. that story, mm -hmm. and then I got a job out of Stanford with a different one, 
and I eventually met Scott and worked with him on several projects. And it sort of, I felt like, you know, years later, I sort of ended up getting the job I had envisioned for myself. And I think it really helped to just have that focus and finding a, just a way to work my way in there. And then, in retrospect, it was a very small industry at the time. I mean, there were maybe 10 startups doing virtual reality. and. You know, they were all very small, so there were maybe a few hundred people working on it. And once you think of it that way, if, once you meet a few of them, it's not that hard. Like, mm -hmm. you're kind of in. Um, yeah. so, so that helped me a lot to just have that focus and, and, and knowing. It just made decisions easier along the way, what internship to go for and what, you know, which people to, to try and meet. Yeah, and when at uh, the moment you eventually met this Scott Fisher, how did that feel? Like? Great, he's such a nice man too. Like he was just a pleasure to work with, and his, I, 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 it was really nice. <laughs> so it was one of those examples where you, you know, you sort of idolize somebody from afar, and then you meet them, and they're actually really nice, not the opposite. Where you're like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, it was good. Uh, we started out talking about Automatic, the company behind WordPress, and you chose to actually. Yeah, tell us a little bit about this company. So maybe you can just, to start out, explain a little bit what does, what is WordPress and what does Automatic do? Sure, yeah, so yeah, Automatic has definitely been the biggest part of my professional life, certainly for the last 10 years. So um, I was CEO of the company for eight years um, and I'm still involved and now. Um, so the main product of Automatic is WordPress, and WordPress is a personal publishing platform. Uh, the, the goal is to let anybody in the world for free publish to the internet, and be it a website or a blog or really anything you want to create. And um, it started as an open source project mm -hmm. and um, got very popular very quickly, and now is powering 26% of all the websites on the internet wow. and has probably close to 100 million users. And So that means um, it's the biggest one. It is, yeah, it's by far the biggest and uh, it's, it's used all over the world, many languages, and people use it uh, for pretty much any type of website you could imagine, from a small personal blog to an e-commerce site to all the way to the New York Times or CNN. And so it's a very flexible piece of software. Mm -hmm. um, one of our goals with it has always been to, to make it accessible to anyone in the world. Our mission is to, to democratize publishing, to make publishing available to everyone. So we want the same piece of software accessible to you as an individual for free or to a giant corporation. And it's sort of a le level playing field for anyone. And it, um, so it started, as I said, as an open source project. And I got introduced to one of the founders of it um, through a guy by the name of Om Malik. Um, mm -hmm. He who is now a partner of mine at True Ventures, which we can talk about later. Okay. Um, so it's all very connected, um, this group of people. But he, at the time, was interviewing me for a story that he was yeah. writing okay. um, because we had just sold um, a previous startup where I was CEO to Yahoo. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a story about it. And as we were talking, this is very 2004, early days of blogging. Mm -hmm. And I knew that Ohm was a writer at a big magazine, but he also had this personal blog, Giga Ohm, that started to get some attention. This is very, very early days of blogging. And uh, we were talking about it. And he said, you know, I've, I've just switched my blog to this new open source project called WordPress, and you should meet the, the co-founder of it, because you guys, I think, would really like each other. And um, that co-founder was Matt Mullenweg. And we ended up meeting here in San Francisco. And it was one of those meetings where we ended up spending four hours and talking about everything. And he was just about to drop out of college and move to San Francisco. Where was and, he? Where, where was he at, at uh, that he's point? He's from Texas. From Texas. Um, so he was at the University of Texas. Um, and. Uh, he, he got a job at CNET at the time, and CNET hired him just to work on WordPress because they found it interesting. And uh, we, we just hit it off, and we started talking. And um, so while I was at Yahoo, after they bought my startup, um, he, WordPress started to get bigger and bigger. And I kept telling Matt, like, you should start a company. Like, this is a real thing. Mm -hmm. like, and at the time, blogging was getting popular, but 
it was still considered not a business. Like, yeah. you know, it was all free. Mm -hmm. And also, there were probably 50 blogging platforms. I mean, it's just everybody had a blogging Fantastic. platform. And, uh, but there was something special about WordPress. And you could tell, like, a lot of the early adopters switched over to it. And all of the big early blogs were on it, you know, Scobalizer and TechCrunch. And, and they were all on, you know, it was all on WordPress. And, and then about a year later, Matt decided that you know, he was ready to start a company. What, how old was he by that time? He was like 21, maybe. Um, so really young. And yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then he asked me if I would like to be CEO of it, um, because he had a very clear vision of the kind of product he wanted to build, but mm -hmm. he didn't really know how to build a company. Yes. So, um, and for me, it was very interesting because it was a new type of company because it was built on open source. And right. I had never done that before. And mm -hmm. how do you, take an open source project, turn it into a company that's successful, and also make sure the open source project stays successful. Mm -hmm. And at the time, there were examples of pure open source projects like Linux or Mozilla that had basically decided to never become a company, and they were thriving in open source. Apache is another one. And then you had others that decided to become companies, and you know, like my MySQL would be an example, that then eventually basically were just a company and the open source piece got smaller. So our challenge was, can we do both? Can yeah. we have a thriving open source project and a thriving company and have them support each other? And I, I thought that was a really interesting challenge. And uh, so we started the company and then um, it just went really well from almost day one. We, we launched a hosted version of WordPress at wordpress.com and it grew very quickly and uh, became a big service. and the, I was very busy just scaling the company, and it's you know, it's at 500 people now, and you know, employees in over 40 countries, and so it's so been a, there. You it's got the busy, answer. Busy ride. You were able to do it. Yeah. You were able to do it. But well, maybe yeah, so maybe the, the maybe tell us like if there were 50 50 blogging platforms, like what was if we would have asked someone back then why did they switch to WordPress? What made WordPress in a kind unique? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so WordPress, I think what made it special from the beginning is, aside from being open source, which did set us apart from some of the commercial proprietary platform, mm -hmm. like Blogger at the time, and uh, TypePad, Movable Type, um, but there were other open source ones. Um, but what made us unique was how customizable and extendable WordPress was. So from day one, it was designed as a very actually small piece of core software that's just the publishing engine. And then it had um, two ways to extend it, has, and still has. It's a plugin API to add functionality. Mm -hmm. And then there's a theming platform to add different themes, which is different designs, look and feel designs yeah. for different websites. Mm -hmm. And both of them were designed to be completely open and really anybody could participate. And we had, so what ended up happening is when when people want to create a, a website, they want, well, most people want a unique site, right? That right. is theirs, that looks unique. It doesn't look like it's just a template and you can tell, you know, it looks like everybody else's website out there. And so WordPress hit that perfect sweet spot where it was customizable enough to make it look like your site. Like somebody would mm -hmm. come there and they couldn't tell, tell. it was WordPress. Okay. And it didn't say WordPress mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also easy enough to use that you didn't, know, you didn't have to know how to program to do that. Mm -hmm. So we, we sort of hit that middle part where you didn't have to write any code, but you got a really nice custom site, thanks to being able to plug in all these features and themes and then tweak it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really the main reason when you, know, when you ask people why they love WordPress, and it, it's usually the answer is something around customization and personalization. And then the other thing that happened, and so, it's, so after a while, a lot of the, the platforms just fell away because they didn't turn into businesses. They, so, but then there were still like you know, 10 or so left that mm -hmm. were trying to build businesses. And everybody picked a slightly different business model. And a lot of them focused on advertising, and we didn't. And I think in the long run, that was the right decision because they all went out of business. <laughs> but you didn't know at that point. What, what made you to, to not do advertisement? Um, there are a couple of reasons. One was that we felt, 
again, our mission was to democratize publishing, to allow anybody to publish. And we really didn't care what people did with their website. If you don't put ads on it, great, but we don't want to force you to put ads on it. And by being advertising focused, you essentially just focus on the 25% or so of, of publishers who are interested in ads, and that's how they make their living. And everybody else, you, you don't focus on. Whereas in our case, we like everybody. You can do anything. As long as you're in WordPress, we're happy. So I think so that you, was a big you got difference. the long tail. Like you got all of them. Yeah. And we, we, we just told people that uh, we, we supported any type of, of use case, not just the advertising-based ones. Mm -hmm. And the other problem with advertising was that we felt like um, we didn't really have anything to offer in that space. There were other ad networks that were doing a fine job, and we just supported them. Mm -hmm. And the, our competitors who started to try to become their own ad networks struggled to really differentiate themselves. Mm -hmm. and, that, and this was a time when Google started coming out with uh, AdWords. And so you're up against Google and companies like that on the advertising side, and it was very tough for them. Um, and so it ended up being a good decision. So our model was a freemium model, where you get the software for free. You can even start a website on our service for free. And then we have upgrades. So if you want your own domain, or you want a sort of custom theme or a special mm -hmm. theme, things like that, or uh, if you want like, video hosting on your site, if you want e-commerce on your site, those are the kinds of upgrades we offered. And that ended up becoming a, a really good business model, I think, for open source in general, not just us, where mm -hmm. you give the core software away for free. Lots of people like, yep, that's kind of your marketing. Mm -hmm. Like people just find it and use it. And so you have lots of people using it. And then some percentage of them need advanced features or they need super high end hosting because they have a lot of traffic. And that's what you charge for those right. features. And probably the domain, almost everyone has its own domain. Yeah, the domain is usually the first thing people want. Once Probably. you get serious about your site, you're like, yeah. you want your, you, own you domain. Want your own domain. You don't want to have dot WordPress, right? Like, how do you um, got from being a founders team of four people? You said I believe four founders. Then you joined as a CEO. How do you get to like 500 people? Like. Mm -hmm. how, how do you do that in organization terms? Like, how do you get everyone busy? How do you keep yeah. it organized? How do you get everyone productive? Yeah. So, yeah, just to, there was one founder, Matt, and then the three initial people who joined them were all engineers from the open source community. Mm -hmm. So they were already contributing to the platform and just joined the company. Mm -hmm. And then I came in as the sort of business person. And then, we, I would say the first, it's pretty easy in the beginning, up to like 20 or 30 people, you just, as soon as you have enough money, you just add more people, there's so much to do. And, and did you already take external money at that point? Or? We had a little bit, yeah. But we also had revenue from day one, so mm -hmm. uh, we, we were able to constantly grow. And so initially, you know, most, and most of the people you hire initially is all product related, right? Because you're, you're just building so a product. So you never did sales at the beginning. The customers you had were customers who just bought additional services, but yeah. they were just marketed over the platform. Yeah, and again, we had the, an, an advantage because the open source project had already been out there for a year. Mm -hmm. So we already had people using the product. So when we launched the paid version, on day one, I think we had 2,000 people sign up. Wow. And then the next day, 2,000 more. And it just it grew very quickly. So we had this kind of running start. Mm -hmm. And we just kept hiring more engineers and designers just to keep building out the feature set. And we had you know, several years of things we wanted to build. So initially, it was really about building that core team. And what ended up happening for us is, again, the open source part of it was an advantage because we just, most of the people we hired were already working on WordPress. They were building plugins or they were going to events. And so that's how we would get to know people. And then we would just hire the ones that were the most into it and contributing a lot. And that got us to about, there's an interesting phase, and I've seen this in other startups where you, your user base grows very quickly at first and we got, you know, to like a million users in, I was gonna say, it's like less than a year. 
but we're, we're still only like 15 people or something. Um, so you can do a lot initially with just a small group of people. And, and then there comes that stage, and I think for us it was like 25 or 30 people, where you have to start thinking about, okay, how are we gonna really organize ourselves? Because now, it's when people start to ask, like, what are you working on? Like, yeah. it's too much going on, right? So you need some level of organization. Mm -hmm. So uh, in our case, that was extra interesting because we ended up growing as a distributed company, hiring people all over the world from day one. So we had that challenge where people weren't in an office together and you couldn't just go have a meeting right. and decide right. what to do. So well, the, the structure that we chose was one that's very highly team-based. So, and it's still to this day, the way the company's organized is everybody's part of a team. Most teams are six to 12 people. If the team gets bigger, then it splits into two teams. Mm -hmm. And every team usually has three or four engineers, maybe a designer, maybe a support person, maybe a business person, if it's a team that works on a paid feature. And each team is very, very self-sufficient. So every, and all the way from, you know, you own this part of the product, you design the feature, you build them, you release them to production. There's all by yourself. There's no sense. It's like a little, a little company in its yeah. in the bigger company. Yeah. And there are no centralized functions where you have to you know, get sign off from somebody else, marketing or design or executive sign off or anything like that, um, because. It wor really worked well for us because the, you know these people were spread around, and having like eight people in a virtual team works really well because you work together all day long. You're in a chat room together. You really get to know each other. But if the entire company has to sort of communicate, it's it's harder. So keeping it small worked well for us. And I really like this idea, you know, as a former software engineer that everybody who works on the product, who designs or writes the software, should be able to release that to the customer and work directly with the customer. Mm -hmm. Unlike most big companies where you write some code and then it gets reviewed and then it goes into QA and then it gets you know, security review and then, you know, by the time it finally ships, it's like three months later yeah. and you have no idea. Like, what it actually is yeah. now. Yeah. And so that direct feedback from the customer is really important. So we designed the entire organization around that idea, where to this day we release code 20, 30 times a day to production, and you know it works across thousands of servers, and everybody in the company has the ability to push a button and release, release code. Software. And um, so, and it's it's one way of doing it. It's worked really well for us, and that's how we've been able to just keep adding more teams and more people. And in, in terms of communication, like you, you said, they are chatting to each other. Do you use any tools for that? And yeah, so for many years we used IRC for chat and then we used an internal version of WordPress that's kind of a, that's a group blogging platform where we do all the collaboration, all the documentation. Mm -hmm. um, we've, and then we've switched around. Um, today we use Slack for the chat, we use WordPress for the collaboration, and we use Zoom for the video conferencing. Because yeah. most teams once a week do like a video check-in. But okay. the rest but of the time... Just the teams, not bigger. Like if you right. talk to, to, to the employees, or now probably Matt as a CEO is talking to, to everyone, if, you, if you're talking to, if you have like a, a company meeting where you talk to, to all of the employees, how, how does that happen? Is this over telephone conference uh, too? No. Or how do you do so that? What we, yeah, so what we we developed there is also kind of a, it's a little bit of a hack, but our own tool where I think we still use Ustream. So basically, you know, Matt, and yeah, I used to do this, but now he'll, he'll sit, he'll do a video chat, so, but you know, everybody can see him on video, mm -hmm. and then there's a chat room on the side, and people chat and have fun ask and questions. ask questions, and he'll sort of read off the questions and then answer, <laughs> and answer. so it's like, a, it's like a remote video interview or something. <laughs> But he works pretty well, so uh, he does that once a month. Once a month. And then also, he travels around a lot, and our teams meet up in person, usually a couple times a year. So he'll maybe go meet up with a team, and then they all do one of these, we call them town halls, one of these meetings once a month. 
So that's a, something we've developed um, so that the town halls and then also we do meet up, meetups in person, team meetups, and then a company meetup once a year. The whole company gets together, gets together for, together for a week. Here in San Francisco? Or uh, we've done Europe? it here. We've done it all over the world. Um, we did, uh, yeah, we've, we've done most of them, I guess, around the U.S., but we did one in Budapest. We did, uh, <laughs> Where is the uh, next the, one? Do you the next know? one is in uh, Whistler, Canada. Uh, we've now, um, we found with like three, four, five hundred people, um, it's hard to find a big event. Right. A venue. It is where, a huge, huge event. Uh, yeah, it's a big event. So we now go to off-season ski resorts. So the last two years we were in Park City, Utah. Now we go to Whistler because they have these huge, beautiful hotels that are empty right. in September when yeah. there's no snow. Right. <laughs> so we take over an entire ski resort. We don't ski. <laughs> <laughs> so you find your own conference hack. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So that, that's what we've been doing for the last few years. Good. And maybe if you tell us a little bit about how the company is working now, like your role, and maybe also being a CEO for eight years and then not leaving the company, but stepping back and handing it back to, to Matt to, to take over. Maybe you can tell us a little bit how that was for you and yeah, how, how, you, how you did that, because from outside it looked very smoothly. Mm -hmm. How you gave over, were there any concerns or did you apply any rules or any things that, that you would recommend to someone else who, who does that in a company? Yeah, it did go smoothly, but it was probably about like a one-year process uh, where um, I started to feel, after eight years, um, I felt like I had, as a company, we had reached some of those first goals we had set for ourselves. So we, we were number one in our market. We had built a big company, and the open source project was thriving. It had tens of thousands of volunteers, and um, we uh, had built a company based on a set of values that we set up in the beginning. It was very open and transparent, and it was very engineering and product driven. Like I said, it was still the, it was all product teams and no big overhead. Um, and I just kind of looked around and said, wow, we've, we've kind of done it. Um, <laughs> and so then the question is, what's next? Mm -hmm. what, what's the next 10 years going to be like? Mm -hmm. And so it was a moment where if I wanted to go do something else, yeah. I felt like this is a good moment. The good. company was just very strong. It was growing. It was well-financed, um, profitable. So I started talking to Matt about it and said, look, it's he was I'm now, done. He's now, he, the, the joke in the end was he, we did the handover on his 30th birthday. Yeah, I read that. <laughs> so he's like blog. old enough yeah, to be CEO now. Okay. Like, like you planned it like already <laughs> 10 years ago. But, uh, but yeah, so I just felt like it's a good moment for somebody else to take the leadership. But I also, you know, I feel like I'm really proud of this company and I love working here. Did you so. think about leaving actually or was it more I'm done, I have reached a certain point or were you at that point where you thought it could be a moment? I mean I, I could have left. I, mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I would still be on the board of directors and involved sure. but um, I also, what helped me was that the whole time I was CEO I was also a partner at a venture capital firm, mm -hmm. True Ventures. and It was always you know, mostly automatic and then a little bit of True Ventures mm -hmm. but I had an opportunity to kind of Both. you know, change that mix. So ah, I could okay. still be at Automatic mm -hmm. more part-time and then do more investing work and kind of gradually change instead of just leaving overnight. Right. And, uh, and yeah, so I ended up um, just um, taking over uh, or creating a product team or really a, a sort of research team, we call it. A, team Tinker, um, <laughs> with the goal of saying at part of the next 10 years of the company is to start thinking about what are we going to do other than WordPress and what are some of the new technologies and new opportunities that we should be looking into that we're not working on because we're so focused on you know, servicing 100 million you know, WordPress right. users. And so this Tinker team is the beginnings of um, it's an internal uh, innovation, new product, and kind of research team, and, uh, and, and that didn't exist. Like you really started that. that. Yeah. So I felt like 
That's something that we should be challenge. doing. Yeah, and, and it as also CEO, felt like... it was like, not possible, right? If you would have been the CEO, you could not start that. Uh, like, not directly. I mean, right. you could have started a team. But yeah. it was a good opportunity to say, and, and I'd really like to go do that. Right. <laughs> so I've been doing that work and then, you know, still around and helping out. But really, the trans transition was very smooth. And, but we, we thought about it for a long time. It, it takes a while to get the investors comfortable and, and the team. And then um, the other thing we did is I took a sabbatical for three months. Mm -hmm. And Matt was sort of acting CEO while I was gone. And there was an opportunity for him to see if he to wanted try, to do if it. if he wants to do it, right? <laughs> and, uh, and it all worked out. That worked out. OK. Yeah. For him, it was really, now I'm ready. I really want to do it. He, like, yeah, I think he was Because really for him, it was probably the bigger change than for you, right? Yeah, I mean, he's he had to take on new responsibilities, and right. you know, he's still doing his old job, and now you okay. know, adding other things. But mm -hmm. but yeah, it's gone well, and I would say, it is interesting how a lot of people around here think it's it's strange that you would step down as CEO, yeah. <laughs> right when the company's getting bigger and bigger, and. Yeah. But I just felt like I'm ready for something new. And, yeah, a lot um, of startups, like you were eight years CEO, a lot of startups at that point, they get sold or bought by someone. And so therefore, there is like they are stepping down too because they are selling to someone. Yeah. And in your case, I think it, it is, it's really an interesting model. And I think you're, you can be, both of you can be really happy that it actually, that you both are the kind of people that you have the personality to do, to do something. And your point on the, on the timing is, is an important one. We, one of the things that Matt and I really agreed on from the beginning is a very long-term view. And for him, it was the idea that he wants WordPress to be around for a long time. And part of that is the beauty of open source is even if Automatic goes out of business or gets sold, the open source project is still there. Like it never goes away. As long as people want to use it and want to work on it, it goes on forever. So unlike a company that has that pressure to grow, 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 and sell or go public, an open source project can have an infinite life. And he really felt like that was important, especially for a publishing platform where you know what you write on the internet should, should be there for a long time. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. And mm -hmm. so from day one, he had that vision. And for me, and I think this is where my Swiss background comes into play, that felt like the right way to build a business. And that's actually not really how people think about it here. There's definitely a five to 10 year timeline where right. you're sort of Especially, expected. Yeah, with investors, right? They have yeah. you as an investor, as a true investor, yeah. you, you, you want to leave yeah. sometimes. You want so, to sell. Yeah, well, it's, that's kind of how the whole system is set up. So we're a little bit unusual in that. It's been a very more gradual, but you know, very, very solid healthy. growth instead of this like huge one, and then you know, and it changes or you know, yeah. it, it gets sold or you know, the business changes. So, um, but we've always thought of it as just a very gradual, long-term kind of a business, and that is, you know, not. A lot of people get into startups think, thinking that it's going to go very fast, and if it works, and it's going to be this rocket ship, and. And then you go on to the next thing. And I'm, I'm hoping some of that will change um, yeah. in the future. But because um, it is it's a lot of work to build one of these companies. <laughs> and it's kind of sad when they go away, even when they're a success. And then they get absorbed into something else. And, and that's it. And it, <laughs> you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, they have that success. And you know, I had it in the past with other companies. And it's very exciting. <laughs> And then a year or two later, like, oh, oh I kind of missed it. It went away, <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. So imagine that Matt would have been brought up somewhere in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And you would have studied at ETH and built a first company. And you met somewhere in Zurich in a bar, and he told you about <laughs> it. What do you think, how would the company look now if you would have started in Switzerland something like WordPress? Would it be the same, or would it be completely different? I, I mean, it wouldn't be the same. But to be honest, of the you know of the many companies I've been involved with, it's probably one that I could imagine the most being based in a place like Switzerland. And that's because because of the way we've built it, it's not a very American or Silicon Valley centric company. And and again, I think a lot of that is because it's so distributed and. And that wasn't an accident. We wanted it that way. We wanted, um, you know, 
being distributed is one of our values as a company. So both distributed with employees, but also with our product, right? The whole idea of WordPress is you can take the software, you can run it on your own server, have your own website with us, whatever, however talking to us. Mm -hmm. And so this notion that you shouldn't try and just have everything centralized and control it, but have it completely distributed as much as possible and sort of push the value and the functionality out to the edges is very central to how we wanted to build a company, how we think the web should work and what's great about the internet. And because of that, we've also sort of pushed geographically all over the world. And, and so WordPress is a very international project. It's still, you know, it, it started in Texas, but it actually started as a fork of another open source project that was in France. <laughs> um, and so because of that, I could easily imagine it being somewhere else. Now, 10 years ago, doing a startup in Switzerland, I think we would have said, let's try it, right? It's, um, because you know, 20 years, 25 years ago when I left, I think it would have been impossible, at least in my mind. I mm -hmm. felt like doing a software startup, you have to go to Silicon Valley. I think 10 years ago, we would probably said, yeah, we can we could probably pull this off. Today, I think, sure, we can do it anywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there any, any things that you would have missed in Switzerland, like that you believe they were really mainly here in San Francisco, but still you said, like, we have our office here, we have 20 people here, and probably you were here at the beginning, Matt moved here from, from Texas, so there was some kind of connection to San Francisco. Like, yeah. what, in, in which way help? There are probably two things. Um, the funding, we did raise some early money, and it helped. It was only like a million or a million and a half, but it just helped to have that security that you know, mm -hmm. we have some money in the bank. Yeah. And I think, I, I, pro I probably could have raised that money in Switzerland, but only because I had a reputation here. Um, mm -hmm. So raising venture capital, this is still you know, the easiest place to do that. Um, the second thing is that some of those early adopters I mentioned, um, so WordPress is only as good as its users and the content that they create, right? If there's, so we spend a lot of time focusing on finding the best bloggers and helping them get onto WordPress and supporting them. Mm -hmm. And they happen to all be around here. Um, right. And so that, we would have had to at least spend some time here mm -hmm. just because that was, again, it was a very small little group and those early blogging conferences were 100 or 200 people and everybody knew each other and it was happening here. And being at the center of that was very useful. Um, just, it just made it easier mm -hmm. um, to work to work with people. So probably WordPress would not be a lot different if it would have been started in Switzerland. So there would have been a little tiny group here in San Francisco and the rest would be distributed. Yeah. And so that's a model that actually would work for Swiss companies. And But probably not being here with someone would not have worked, right? Yeah, you have to be, I mean, you have to be where your customers are. Um, and the early, especially the early adopters were here. You had to convince them to then get all the others onboard it to, to WordPress. Yeah. And, and a lot of that, you know, initially is, is a personal contact with people because, you know, WordPress is a good product, but it wasn't, like, again, there were lots of other platforms and lots of other choices for people. And we, you know, being there in the moment and convincing somebody to do it and try it and, and you know, making sure it all works is just crucial in the beginning. And, you just have to be there and when there's an opportunity. When you, know, you see somebody at a conference, you know, come on, let's start a website. You know, I'll do it for you right now. <laughs> um, so that, that's helpful. And yeah, I would say, but yeah, I, I certainly have, you know, people who built the product can be anywhere. But you were CEO for eight years with Automatic. Um, do you have any advice for younger CEOs who are building their company in terms of scaling? Or with Atizo, I always felt a little bit alone. And how did you handle that? How did you, did you kept believing and kept being motivated? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was, I think my automatic CEO job was my third time being, being a, a CEO. CEO. So that helped. <laughs> so first time we started a company, it was five of us. 1999, and uh, 
raised a bunch of money, built the product, and then it went out of business. So it was a failure. Oh, okay. Um, very depressing. Um, but you kept going. And then, yeah, and then went into another startup. You know, next startup was Outpost, the CEO there, and that's when we sold to Yahoo. But we were only about 15 people uh, when we sold it, so it was, it was a success, but we were still small. So, and then really with Automatic was the first time where I went to a certain scale. And it, it, is, it is a lonely job. Um, you're the only, I mean, that's the whole point. You have one person in the organization that were, has the ultimate responsibility for whatever happens in the company. And you want that to be one person, right? You don't want a committee of people who can't agree. So it's by design a lonely job. And I think some people like that and some people don't. So you have to, you know, it's, it's just not for everyone. Um, there are certainly resources. Um, there are other, like in San Francisco, there are a lot, a lot of other startup CEOs around. Um, as an investor at True Venture, we spend a lot of time connecting all the founders and CEOs in our portfolio to just help each other and have a peer group. Um, what helped me was an organization called YPO, a Young Presidents Organization. I've been a member of it for about seven years, and it's a, it's a, a group of all CEOs of growth stage companies, so bigger companies mm -hmm. that are really starting to go through some of those growth and challenges. This organization is just here in San Francisco? It's a worldwide organization. Um, San Francisco has four chapters, I believe. I'm in one of them. Um, and it's, it's an incredible group. And you, you end up being organized, again, into a small team in the end. <laughs> um, about eight of us. Um, our chapter is about 40 people. And then you're in a group called a forum of eight. So it's eight CEOs, and you meet once a month for a whole day. And you just talk about anything in your life, at work, at home. And everybody's incredibly open and supportive, and it's completely confidential. So whatever happens in that group stays in that group. And it's very freeing to be able to talk about issues where you might just not have anybody else. Because you, know, you have a board of directors, but they're interested in the business and not, let's say, your personal life. Or you might have a spouse, but you know, they're, they're not a CEO. Um, so just being with like-minded people and, and opening up, I think, is, can be very, very helpful. And realizing that everybody's going through the same thing. Everybody is going through the same thing. It's like, it's kind of amazing. And it's really, it's kind of freeing. You realize, oh, it's not just I'm not me. alone. Yeah. I'm alone in my company, but I'm not alone yeah. in the world. And the other thing I would say is you have to really think about your company in stages. So when you first start, it's that seed stage. It's five people. It's 10 people. That's one type of job. So I said earlier, like a, some of my early job was just finding bloggers and getting them excited about WordPress. And you do a lot of things one on one. And a lot of it is just building excitement around your idea and attracting people and attracting investors. And you're kind of this evangelist, right? And it's a lot of one on one um, and, and, and sort of getting your vision, articulating your vision in a way that other people want to be part of it. And it's very direct. And then you get to a stage, then you have a product. Hopefully, you get to the next stage. You have a product, and it's successful. Like People want it. So you have customers now, and real customers. So now you have to figure out how to make those customers happy. So that's the phase where you start to build out other functions of your business. So you have sales, you have marketing, you have operations, you have all. And that's where some CEOs feel like, ah, I don't want to, you know, I like being this early a product stage. kind of vision person, but I really don't care about these other things. So that might be a stage where you just bring somebody else in who wants to do that. And also, a lot of CEOs just haven't done those other functions. So it's really crucial to find good people and trust those people mm -hmm. and, and get an appreciation for those other functions. So, and then the third phase is the scale. So now, hopefully, you have a business that's working. And now you're just trying to make it huge, mm -hmm. and that's where you—that's where you, nothing is direct anymore. You just have a team, and they have a team, and they have people working, and it's all about setting it up in a way that the whole organ organization actually works, yeah. and people work together, and they're motivated, and they know what they're doing and why they're doing it, and so the job becomes much more strategic and planning and communicating and just hiring good people and. 
you're not doing anything hands-on anymore. You're not supposed right. to. Um, and and that's, a, that's a different job. I mean, that's like, and some people like that and some people don't. And a lot of traditional CEOs, that's what they do. They're, mm -hmm. Like a, a large company CEO, um, that's their skill set. Right. That's very different from the person from starting the, the company. And some people grow and mm -hmm. still like the job and keep going. And some people just go, oh, I, I don't want to do that. Let's bring in somebody else. And that's yeah. totally fine, too. But right. knowing that the, the job changes and understanding when that happens and having advisors around you who can tell you, oh, this is what's going to happen next and make mm -hmm. sure you're ready for it is really important because I think it gets frustrating and stressful when the organization changes and grows and you're not growing with it. And you're still holding on to like, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm, the best, you know, I'm the best engineer in here. I'm going to be in there and still do that. And then right. everybody else is like, no, you're like <laughs> supposed to run this whole company. So, um, and that's, you know, that's not obvious. So it's almost like your job changes completely every couple of years and you, you just have to be aware of that. We were talking about um, how a CEO can get feedback and you, you were um, talking about this YPO organization where, where you have peers. Are there any things you can recommend for a CEO to get feedback and someone that helps them through the phases of, of being a CEO? Yeah, so again, for me, it was very helpful to have a, a peer group like that. And I think there are other resources available. Uh, what's important, in my opinion, is you're not looking for networking. You're not looking for people to do business with or getting to know people. You're looking for a peer group who wants to learn from each other and be very open and honest. And the confidentiality of it is really, really important. So if you can find a group like that, it doesn't have to be YPO. It can work in a lot of different scenarios. So. For example, we do the same thing at True Ventures for our portfolio as a, an optional. If you're a, a founder or CEO um, of a true backed company, uh, we make forms available. And they work really well. The people who are in them really, really like them. Um, another example is um, there's that famous book by Sheryl Sandberg, Lean In. I don't know what it's called in German. but. Mm -hmm. um, she used that same YPO forum model, and um, I think they're called lean-in circles, um, and she recommends the same thing. Just get uh, a number of business women who are going through the same thing and form a circle and support, yeah. to support each other. Um, so it can, it can work, that, that same model can work. Um, and then an, another example would be some of the accelerators and, and startup incubators that, um, where you essentially have 10 or 20 peer companies going through it together and learning from each other. And I've talked to a lot of, of startups that have really liked that, just to get that initial boost, boost to kind of right. get going. So those are the kinds of things that I think really work in the beginning, especially. How, how do you think about mentors and mentorship? Is this something you recommend? Is this maybe something you do? Are you a mentor or did you have at a certain stage a mentor? Yeah, I, so I, I work with a number of CEOs and, and of course, startups. Um, I think it's, it works really well for some people. I think as a, as a CEO, you have to really reach out and take advantage of the resources and, and get mentors and advisors around you. And it's, it's actually a bunch of work to keep that going. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Silicon Valley is famous for people being very helpful and open and you know, wanting to help sort of the next generation of people to, because, you know, I had the same experience. People were very generous with their time with me, so I'm doing the You're same giving. thing. Um, you just have to find a good personality fit, like somebody has a similar style to yours and can really help you, right. you know, develop your skills. Yeah. Maybe that brings us to the, to the question of the of the ecosystem in Switzerland, of the startup ecosystem, and how we can develop an ecosystem that might be similar to the Silicon Valley or that can learn from the Silicon Valley. I don't know how familiar, how close you are, but maybe thinking of Switzerland and thinking of startups in Switzerland, do you have any recommendation to the ecosystem, to the people involved? Sure, yeah. Um, so first of all, I think it's already happening. Um, I talked to a lot of Swiss startups, and 
more and more, they look pretty much the same as startups from anywhere else, um, in a good way. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's um, so I think it's happening. It's developing. There are startups. There is an, an, an ecosystem. I think there are many things you can copy from Silicon Valley that work really, really well, and I think that's already happening. But um, certainly the. You know, Switzerland has advantages. You have universities, you have really smart people, you have investment capital, you have a generally a very innovation-based you know, economy and mindset. Um, and I think the, the things that work in Silicon Valley is certainly a lot of it is tied to venture capital, so you know, high-risk investment mm -hmm. that I think is starting to happen in Switzerland, but it's still nothing like here where you have Investors like us at True Ventures looking for risky, you know, risky startups, risky in a way, you know, yeah. market risk. Like, you know, right. we don't know if it's going to work, but if oh, it works, try. it could be huge. Yeah. Um, and willing to just write checks to people without any kind of proof that it's going to work. Um, I think that's still hard for Swiss investors because um, it's just such a different model. Um, but it's starting to happen, and I think as the successes happen and it starts to work, it keeps building. So I think that's all promising. I would say ultimately you can't be another Silicon Valley. You have to be unique in right, some way. Right. And so for Switzerland, I think it's important to think about what is Switzerland great at that Silicon Valley isn't. And to me, I, I would say, you know, if I think of Switzerland, or if you ask anybody here about, you know, Switzerland, what, what does that make you think of? It's things like neutrality, stability, safety. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes people think that's kind of the opposite of a startup, like startups are risk and, you know, high growth and everything's fast, and Switzerland's kind of slow and deliberate and long term. But I think. I think that can be a strength. I think you, you look at, okay, what are areas where kind of that long-term view and that stability and long-term thinking are actually an advantage? Mm -hmm. um, and there are definitely areas that Switzerland can be very competitive because people here in Silicon Valley just won't do it if, because it's too long-term. And you know, I would right. think, and some of it's already happening, things like data, right, data storage. It's perfect for Switzerland. It's, you know, it's, can all the pieces fit for somebody to go, oh yeah, I want to put my data on Switzerland, it makes sense. And mm -hmm. a Swiss entrepreneur thinking, oh, I want to build a company and think out 20, 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. and you know, what, what do I have to build to, for the data to be available for that long and to be that secure? A Silicon Valley startup is, doesn't think that way. Um, another area you know, might be identity. Um, it's another, you know, I think it's a natural area where people would really be drawn to a, a Swiss company uh, versus maybe somewhere else in the world. Because so Switzerland was neutral by, yeah, by a long-term history. It's that trust, like that immediate trust you get. Mm -hmm. Like, it's the reason why people put money in Switzerland too. They just kind of mm -hmm. trust that nothing yeah. wild is gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm gonna put my data, that's where I'm gonna put my, you know, identity, privacy issues like that. So I would say, you know, pick what you're really good at and what makes you unique, and then, and then bet focus. on that. And yeah. Focus on that instead of trying to be beat Silicon Valley yeah. at number two. Being Silicon Valley, it's not going to happen. Silicon right. Valley is really good at yeah. you know. That's their things. Thing. But if someone like from Switzerland, if some, if a young entrepreneur um, tries to raise money from you now, having an identity or a, or a data idea where he says, "Hey, that really fits to Switzerland," and um, uh, but I, I don't find investors there, as, as you said, probably because it's not proven and he has no proof. And he says, I believe I'm at the right spot. I'm in Switzerland. I, got, I learned at ETH. I learned the skills that I need and I want to grow a company like that. And he comes to you and says, hey, you as maybe not you as a, with a Swiss history, but maybe you as a, as a Silicon Valley investor. Is mm -hmm. that a model where, uh, where you believe in the future investors from Silicon Valley are open to invest in Swiss companies? or because from history we see that the last 10 years, maybe it starts to change, I don't know what, what ex ex um, impression you got, but from history you know that mainly they invest in Silicon Valley companies. So what, what yeah. do you think about a model like it's that? It's starting to happen. And then, but to those companies you would give the same recommendation as you said for WordPress or for Automatic, where you say, okay, some certain functionalities have to be, or some, some roles have to be 
at a certain place in the world. So you have to travel where the customers are. And yeah, most Swiss startups I talk to want to have an office in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, just mm -hmm. a customer, some kind of at least one person who mm -hmm. can interact with customers. Um, yeah, development usually is already spread all over the place anyway. Um, but I think Switzerland's a great place for product development and other things. But uh, yeah, just have an office here and start to work with US customers. Is there any advice to Swiss investors that you would say maybe your experience from True Ventures, you're doing that over 10 years now, right? Yeah. So is there anything where you say, I believe that could help Swiss investors? I would say, interestingly, I don't know as many Swiss investors as I do entrepreneurs. So I feel like the ones I've met are seem very motivated and eager to really help build up that, that ecosystem. So um, I think the advice, if any, would be that you know just really stick with it. Like it's, I think startups over the last few years have become very popular, mm -hmm. and now I think we're heading into a little bit of a slowdown. Yep. And you know, make sure you you, you don't. Keep on going. Yeah, you keep going because now I think the next year or two would be a time where maybe people go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it didn't work, let's try something else, but yeah. it'll come back again. Yeah. And actually, I think the next two years are a great time to invest mm -hmm. because um, there's, it's a more rational market. I think the, the people are starting companies right now because it's a little harder. Um, there's not as much money around right now. Um, they're really serious entrepreneurs who are just, I think are gonna do really well. Have you, uh, during the last couple of years, let's take maybe a time span of 10 years, did you build any habits or any mm -hmm. rituals or, or things that helped you being staying healthy, being at the full energy level that we've met already several times and you are always Tony and you are <laughs> always in such a good shape and so, so motivated to help and to, to talk about things. Are there any, do you have any, any hacks, life hacks that help you to, to do what you're doing? Right, well, I would say, I mean, for me, by far the biggest one is just working from home. And that, ever since I started doing that 10 years ago, um, it's made my career much healthier and easier. Um, and it's also made it possible to have two jobs, have the mm -hmm. investing and, and startup jobs and um, be able to go back and forth and not feel like I'm missing out in one or the other because everything happens online anyway. Um, right. And How much time do you work from home? Like in a, in, um, a, in a week or like, are you? I mean, right now I would say like 60, 70% of my time. Um, and, and, you know, the biggest, Pay off for me as family, so I can, you know, I'm I'm there mm -hmm. for my family. And how do you and do it? Like, is it you close the door and then your kids know Tony is working and don't come in, or how do you how do you yeah, how was, do you do that? Like working at home, working at home is a challenge sometimes because there yeah. is still distraction. Yeah, I have a separate space, um, and I work in a lot of bursts. Like I'm really productive yeah. and creative mm -hmm. and for a few hours and I get a lot done and then I, I don't and then yeah. I just leave and do something else. So when I'm in one of those modes, then yeah. I, you know, I just... Then no one could, no, nothing could distract Yeah, I you. like, yeah, I, I just ignore whatever's going on. But, uh, <laughs> but what, you know, what it allowed me, what it has allowed me to do is, is have both a very rich family life mm -hmm. and work really hard and not feel like that awful trade-off where, mm -hmm. You know, you're, for me, before I did that, it was always, you know, 5, 6, 7 p.m. comes around at mm. the office and everybody's working mm, and it's yeah. fun and you're like, oh, you I, know, but I want to be kids, home yeah. with the kids. The kids go and, to bed at certain yeah, times. Yeah, and, and it just, it always them. felt like this awful trade-off and now I don't have that. I've, you know, I would say for the last 10 years I've had dinner with my family 90 percent of the time, 95 percent. I mean, it's mm -hmm. every night we have dinner together. It's really important to us yeah. to make sure it happens every night. I, I think that's another, <laughs> it's not really a life hack, it's just, yeah. I just really But it's a family it. habit, yeah. like and having dinner think, together. Yeah, it's really, really, really important in my opinion. And so arranging your work life in a way where you can be there for your family, I think is, is to me the, the most important because I've always wanted both and mm -hmm. I wanted to, not have to make that 
trade-off. And it's been probably the, for me the happiest outcome at Automatic is hearing people describe their job and saying mm -hmm. they could never go back to their previous job because now they're at home with their kids and their families mm -hmm. and and it's just it's amazing. And you, if you can, you know, you, you can be you really can be there um, mm -hmm. and and have it both ways. So that to me would by it's by far, far the, the most, most important thing that I would never change back. Trade. Like, and, and, and it doesn't have to be that way. And it's, I think part of it is, I think, being Swiss and growing up in Switzerland has helped me push for that. Mm -hmm. Because in my career, there's been a lot of pushback, even early on when you know, I would take long vacations. I um, would take a summer off and spend a summer in Switzerland. Or I spend a summer with, with my family driving around the US in a van. And, I would just do it, and a lot of people would be like, oh, the European guy, take me a lot of vacation. Like, I would get a lot of like, yeah. flack like that. I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah <laughs> you sure. should do it too. <laughs> and, you know, when, and then once you have a certain level of success, you can do that yeah, and right. you know, not get right. fired. Yeah. Um, but I, there's definitely a lot of peer pressure here in the US to always work, 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 work. Mm -hmm. and I just don't believe in it. I, because people aren't productive for that much. Mm -hmm. They sit at work and they, you know, they pretend to be working, but, but you, they can't, don't. you can't. I, I can't yeah. work ten hours a day productively. I yeah. just can't. You know, it's it's too much. So I feel like when you give people the flexibility to work from home, to take take time as they need it, mm -hmm. they just they get just as much done. They just spend those other hours doing something else that they might just sit around at work and not be as productive. So. So at Automatic, we, we let people take as much vacation as they want. They can take time off, work from home, and we're incredibly productive. Like, nobody is slacking off. If anything, we have to tell people, like, hey, you need to take some time oh. off. Um, so that, that would be my, my biggest one. Nice. Are there any others? Are there any maybe organizational skills or yeah, how you deal with email, how you deal with communication, information oh. overflow, how do you yeah. deal with that? Well, so another thing we did at Automatic from day one is no email. Like, nobody uses email in the company. Okay. We only use it with outside people. Mm -hmm. um, and that was huge. Um, and it was because, again, we, we wanted to be distributed and one of the keys when you're not in an office together is for everybody to feel like they actually know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And if you have email conversations going on, and it makes people feel like mm -hmm. they're, they're, not, you know, they're not in the loop. So, so from day one, we only use tools where everybody can see everything, unless it's like an obviously private conversation. But um, so we have 10 years of archives of every message that anybody's ever sent to anybody else in the company. It's all searchable. Anybody can see it. It's great. Um, I would, you know, and we do the same thing at True Ventures. Um, and it's, it's just uh, on so many levels, it's a better system. So I would highly recommend that. Just get rid of email. email. And I used to run an email startup, so I actually really <laughs> like email. But it, uh, you know, unless you copy yeah. everybody in the company on everything, it's not a good idea. Yeah, it has really been great to be here. Um, yeah, I think we had a great discussion. And probably having someone like you in, I would say, we, you are you are not like right in front of our doorstep in Switzerland, but you are still kind of attached to the, to the Swiss ecosystem. So if there are people out there who would like to get questions answered by you or who would like to get in touch, like what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, so first of all, I want to say thank you that you're doing this. I think it's, it's great. And I think it's an example of the kinds of things that will help you know, entrepreneurs anywhere. But um, just you know, letting people know who have this idea that, oh, maybe I might start a company someday, that there are lots of ways of doing it. And uh, there's lots of help out there. Um, for me personally, the best way to get in touch with me is my blog, of course, tony.org. Um, and I do, I really enjoy meetings with entrepreneurs and I, they get introduced to me in various ways. Um, I was trying to remember how we first got introduced, was, was it through Mike Nath? I would say yeah. through Mike Nath. And you know, it's a great example. You, we met several years ago and you had a really cool startup idea and you, know, you came here to Silicon Valley and started talking to people. And I really want to encourage everyone to just, you know, to do that. And so in my case, you know, there's, uh, 
people in Switzerland who know me, there's also a Swiss Next here in San Francisco, and they host Swiss startups and sort of help introduce them into the ecosystem here. And so I've, I've met quite a few startups through that. Um, and generally, I, I just want to encourage people to do that, to do what you did, and yeah, just say, look, reach let's, out. let's go and, and see like, mm -hmm. um, what, you know, what's, what's possible. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm really encouraged that more and more uh, Swiss entrepreneurs are, are doing that. Great. Yeah, maybe so we really um, are closing our, our talk. Uh, maybe a last question. Is there anything you want to add to what we have been talking about? Is there anything that still sits on your mind and you want to get out to the people watching us? I would say maybe the final, final thing would be that the, I think that the thing that's still a little bit hard for for Swiss, both investors and entrepreneurs, is that the risk taking, mm -hmm. and you know this is what Silicon Valley is really good at, like really dramatic, you know, just risk taking. And I do still see some Swiss startups that have like a really great team, really great idea and product, but then they're a little bit timid on the business model, mm -hmm. like the the risk taking on just building something crazy and see what happens is, mm -hmm. I think, still a little hard. Um, people, startups I see are still a little bit traditional when it comes to how we're going to make money. And, uh, and that the way that comes out is um, a lot of ideas about partnering with bigger companies or maybe licensing technology or things where you're sort of um, playing along with the existing mm -hmm. sort of larger companies, yeah. which I think is not a good idea for startups. I think you have to really find your own way. Um, and be in your control of your own destiny and your own business model, even if you don't know what that's going to be. Um, so I think that's something that people around here do really well. They mm -hmm. just completely ignore what came before and just start something new. Um, and so that would be my final um, uh, piece of advice, is don't, don't be afraid to, to do that, because I think that has been really successful uh, for yeah. people in the past. So well, that's something we really can learn from Silicon Valley, to take more risks, not being afraid, really a disruptive business model. Yeah, and, and risk around market and business model is good risk, because you want to mm -hmm. change that. You don't want to take like, people risk, like you, you don't want to work with people that you're not sure about. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want to have in, you know, financing risk. You're trying to have investors who are going to be there for you, so you can you know, minimize other types of risks. But, take a lot of risk when it comes to the market and the business model so that if it works, it could really be big. Good. Great. So great talking to you. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, hope to stay in touch. Thank you. Thank Have you a... for coming to San Francisco. Have a very good day. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Bye. <laughs>